Hey everybody, welcome back to an all new episode of Tend to Life with me, Annie Elise. Now, every time that I tell a story involving children, I find myself feeling especially sad and honestly just very worried for them. I mean, it's tough enough just for adults to deal with serious trauma. When you add children into the mix, I mean, it makes it that much more difficult. And in today's episode, I'm going to talk about a woman who survived possibly the worst childhood imaginable. She went through the absolute ringer and she came out stronger for it. She achieved things that most adults only dream of. But sadly, after everything that she overcame and all that she accomplished, she still couldn't escape violence or a very, very deadly crime. So this is the story of Crystal McDowell. Crystal McDowell was born on October 26, 1979 in Baytown, Texas. Unfortunately, she didn't have a really great childhood and she had to deal with a lot of challenges right from the get-go. Both of her parents struggled with addiction and unfortunately, they each died when Crystal was just 11 years old. It wasn't like they were in the same car accident or anything like that. I mean, the deaths, they were months apart from one another. They were separate incidents, but they were one right after another. Then, just two years later, Crystal was kidnapped and she was physically and sexually attacked. Her abductor kept her inside a chicken coop and the mistreatment just went on nonstop until she miraculously managed to escape. Now, I can't even imagine what it would be like to survive something like this, even before you remember that she also had lost both of her parents. She had lost them not very long before all of this happened. So after all of this horrendous trauma, Crystal ended up moving in with her aunt and uncle. And everybody was really hopeful that she would finally be able to have, I don't know, a normal life and as normal as it could be. I mean, how much can anybody take at especially such a young age? But luckily, Crystal was a fighter. And I mean, I guess that she had to be given everything that she went through. But the good news is she learned how to push herself even when she didn't have much of a support system in place. So she stayed in school, she worked hard, and then she got her diploma. Now, right out of high school, Crystal became a flight attendant, and she was good at it, and she loved being able to fly all over the world. She was blonde with blue eyes, very outgoing, and basically exactly what you would picture when you imagine your stereotypical successful flight attendant, like from the olden days, kind of just like the typical traditional look. And Crystal also really knew how to talk to people, which was really kind of a must-have when she was dealing with these stressed-out travelers on these long flights on a regular basis. She always knew the exact right thing to say to make people feel safe, make them feel calm, make them feel taken care of. So eventually, she would climb the ranks and become a training instructor for new flight attendants at her company. Now, if you look at the pictures of Crystal when she had this job, you can almost feel the positivity just radiating off of her. It was very obvious that Crystal was so passionate about what she was doing and absolutely loved her job. Naturally, all of this career success also helped boost Crystal's confidence. She wasn't that scared little girl who had been orphaned and then attacked. I mean, not anymore. She was now okay, and she was okay with being herself. And eventually, she felt ready to venture into this scary world of dating as well, especially once she met a man named Steve McDowell. Now, Crystal had dated other guys before, but Steve was the first person that she ever got really serious about. Even her aunt could tell that Crystal was just head over heels. She actually described Crystal as smitten with him. And Steve was described by those who knew him as being kind of like this big kid. And from the sounds of it, that's what Crystal needed. She never had a childhood, and she liked the way that Steve would help her kind of just bring on that more playful side, that more young side, youthful side. It's not clear exactly how long they dated, but they ended up getting married in 2007. But then, right after the wedding, some of Crystal's family members started to notice that maybe their relationship wasn't as rock solid as it needed to be. Crystal's aunt said that she noticed pretty early on in their marriage that Steve became more like a brother to Crystal than a husband. And it was very clear that their marriage had lost its initial spark. But for whatever reason, they stayed together. And within the first few years of their marriage, they welcomed their first child together, a son named Madden. Then three years later, they welcomed their daughter, Maui. 
Now, they were Crystal's absolute pride and joy. She doted on these kids like nothing else on earth even mattered. Now, Steve also had another daughter from a previous relationship. Her name was Krista, and she was a bit older than Madden and Maui, and she had actually lived with Steve and Crystal for a period of time when she was in high school. So being much older, she was also able to kind of pick up on the fact that Steve and Crystal weren't necessarily this happy married couple or as happy as a married couple should be or is supposed to be. Goofy guy, like that's the best way I could describe him. How old were you when you lived with him? Um, I was in high school, so I guess I was 14 to about 16. Did you see the relationship between the two of them? My dad and Crystal? Yeah. Yes, I mean, obviously they tried to hide, like, um, if they were fighting from me and stuff because I'm just a kid, you know. But at the same time, you can feel, like, the tension in the room and you can tell when they're arguing. And the two years you were with them, were they mostly happy? It seemed like they were mostly happy. When they did have, like, big fights, she would go and run to Facebook and post about how much she loved her family and how proud she was that they were her family. And my dad would do the same stuff, so it was like... They were really fake towards social media. Sounds like um, they wanted the perfect family. Yeah. So if anything, Crystal and Steve seemed to almost be overcompensating. In particular, their social media accounts were full of pictures of them laughing, smiling, and acting super in love. And it was your typical case of somebody's internet persona just living their best life with their real life kind of hidden behind the scenes, and you don't really get a true glimpse into that. But it seemed like they wanted the whole world to believe that they were happy, and that maybe if they could fool everybody else, they could fool themselves too. Yet behind the scenes, Crystal was definitely not happy in her marriage. She ended up cheating on Steve, and not just as this little one-off incident of bad judgment. She was still a flight attendant at this point, not an instructor, and her job took her all over the country, remember. So for years, she would have these casual hookups in all different cities, city after city, one after the next, with both men and with women. Ultimately, Steve found out, and he and Crystal fought about the affairs. I mean, non-stop. It wasn't the only thing they argued about, though, either. I mean, everything was just getting worse with each passing day. And from the sound of it, everybody knew that Crystal and Steve would just be a lot happier if they just called it quits. But I guess their friends and family kind of all treated it as one of those situations where don't ask, don't tell, they'll figure it out, they'll work it out, which I do get. Nobody wants to be the messenger to tell their friend or family member that they should start thinking seriously about a divorce. And frankly, if somebody's not ready for that talk, there's nothing that you can say to convince them anyway. So sometimes the best move is just to let somebody work their issues out for themselves on their own timeline. Now in the meantime, Crystal was getting more and more unhappy about everything. Not just her marriage, but it sounds like the airline industry was also kind of losing its shine for her. So Crystal was ready to start something new. So she decided she wanted to start exploring other career paths. And luckily for her, the aunt and uncle who raised her actually owned a real estate company called Virginia Malone & Associates. And this company was doing really well. So Crystal might have liked the idea that the company had been running since 1957. It had this long history, which meant stability. So she got her real estate license and she followed in the footsteps of her aunt and uncle and also the footsteps of her grandparents who had founded the company in the first place. So when you think about it, real estate was quite literally in her blood. And she found success right away, just like how she found success and was the star flight attendant right out of the gate. So after selling home after home, it really did not take long for Crystal to become the breadwinner in her family. And just to put it into perspective how much money Crystal was making, her uncle told Dateline that she would bring the business tens of thousands of dollars in revenue every single month. And she never had an off month. Always was kind of just consistent. Always growing. So maybe that was the kick in the pants that Crystal needed to realize that she was strong and she was independent enough to take care of herself. I'm honestly not entirely sure of her mindset, but I do know that in June of 2017, after over 10 years of being married, Steve and Crystal finally decided to get a divorce. Now, apparently the decision was mutual and they handled the split with a lot of maturity. There was no real fuss involved at all. And she and Steve also decided to split custody 50-50. Now, since Steve had been relying on all of her real estate money for quite a while, she helped him buy a home in a nice area. And to be fair, this wasn't something she did solely out of the goodness of her heart. I mean, she wanted to make sure that the kids had a nice place to stay when they were with their dad. She also bought a new house for herself too, but it was a little bit of a fixer-upper. 
And Crystal couldn't stay there until she finished some of these renovations. So rather than find a friend to crash with or even get a hotel, she just decided, I'm going to just stay with Steve in his new home, the one that I bought for him. It's nice. And I know it's kind of a wild move to move in with your ex, right, when the divorce is getting finalized. But I think that it's worth remembering that Crystal and Steve had already lived together for about a decade, and the marriage seemed to end on fairly good terms, all things considered. So how bad could it really be to stay under the same roof for maybe a few more months? They even figured that it might help with the kids and with that transition since they were only eight and five years old at the time. You know, instead of having to jump straight into this like new normal, they could all kind of ease into this divorced life a little bit more slowly. So to set the scene, Crystal was newly single, but she was still living with her ex. And that's when she got back into the dating scene again. Now this time, it was officially back in the dating scene. There was no more dealing with this guilt of knowing that she had a husband at home and she was having affairs. It was all on the up and up. But at the same time, even though she she was officially single, Crystal still wasn't totally comfortable with being super out in the open about her new relationships, which we will get into more in a little bit here. Then, in the summer of 2017, she met a man named Paul Hargrave. Now, Paul was a local jeweler in the area who had made a name for himself and for his business, similar to how Crystal had made a name for herself in the real estate world. When they met, Crystal basically went into his store to get her grandmother's ring remade. And then she left with the ring and with a new man. Not really, but they did have this undeniable chemistry from the moment that they met. So Crystal's friends and family said that they had never seen her as happy as she was when she was with Paul. Even when she first started dating Steve, she didn't come to life the way that she now was in this new relationship. She didn't have that sparkle about her. Now, she wanted to take things slow, of course, with the recent divorce and all. But in spite of that, she and Paul, I mean, they moved pretty quickly. And they agreed that they wanted to be exclusive almost from the jump. And after that, as Paul put it, their relationship heated up quicker than a summer in Texas. That is a direct quote. They sent text messages back and forth that they loved each other, and Crystal even invited Paul to move in with her as soon as her new house was renovated. From my understanding, this was all while Crystal was still trying to keep her relationship with Paul a secret, though, from Steve. And I'm not sure when she planned to break the news exactly, but she had a good reason to keep quiet. Because apparently, on multiple occasions, she told Paul that she wasn't sure if she would be safe once Steve found out. And she also said that she didn't want to be living in Steve's house when he learned that she was in a relationship with somebody new. So in a way, she was still sneaking around a little bit, even though she didn't necessarily need to be. And as it turns out, Steve had always been pretty possessive. And even though they were officially split up, Crystal worried that if she was sending the wrong message by continuing to live with him, maybe he thought that they would get back together down the road. So this was already a pretty tricky situation. I mean, Crystal was head over heels for this new guy who, keep in mind, she had only been dating for a few weeks at this point, and she was also trying to hide him from her ex, who she was living with. But then there was this big upcoming event that was about to put her in a spot where she had to come clean. She would have no other choice, and she would have to just admit what was going on. See, Crystal and Steve had planned on a family cruise with the kids. And it was only a couple of months away at this point. And to be honest, this next part, it is a little bit confusing. But apparently, Crystal invited Paul to come on the cruise with them. She brought it up less than three weeks after she had met him and they started dating. She was already letting him in on their family plans and inviting him. Now, besides the quickness of that invitation, I don't get why she would want him on that cruise if their relationship was supposed to be a secret. It definitely doesn't sound like the best way to break the news to somebody that you're seeing somebody new. I mean, I can't imagine being stuck on a boat with your new girlfriend and her jealous ex plus their kids, all of whom you only just realized existed. I mean, best case scenario, it would probably be the most awkward vacation of all time. Worst case scenario, mm, I don't even want to imagine it. And that's exactly why Paul declined the invitation. It just all seemed way too weird for him. He didn't want to go if Steve was going. So then Crystal decided she'd rather have Paul go with her and the kids than Steve. So she told Steve that he was no longer invited on this cruise. It's not clear if Steve knew it was because there was another guy going instead of him and now this new relationship, or whether Crystal uninvited him with no explanation. But one thing we do know is Steve was furious about the entire thing. As it turned out, Crystal was 100% right, too, to worry that Steve was hoping that they would get back together. Apparently, he told some of his closest friends that he was planning on proposing during that cruise. Now, whether or not he knew specifically about Paul or somebody else taking his place, 
I mean, he probably had his suspicions, but it wasn't good. Nobody was on the same track. And honestly, I'm not sure if the cruise trip ever even happened at all after that. But the damage was done. It seems like either way, Steve figured out that he had been disinvited all because of a new man in Crystal's life. And it became an issue. So now, things were super contentious. They were super bad between the two of them. And they only got worse on August 25th, 2017. Crystal had spent the night over at Paul's house, her new boyfriend, but she did get up pretty early. Every news channel was talking all about how Hurricane Harvey was making its way toward Texas and toward Louisiana, so Crystal and Paul were worried about it. And before she left, she talked to him about whether or not they should evacuate or if they should just wait out the storm. Luckily, she didn't have to go to work that day, and she was originally supposed to show a house to some buyers, but they ended up canceling because of the weather. Steve was still working, though, so Crystal told Paul that she was going to go pick up the kids, and then they could figure out their plans. So she left around 7 a.m., and then she texted Paul to say that she was just going to stay at Steve's house rather than try to drive in the storm. It made sense, but Paul didn't like the fact that she was going to be away. And as the rain kept coming down harder and harder, Paul got more worried, especially after Crystal stopped answering any of his calls or his text messages that afternoon. I mean, it was total radio silence. That morning, we woke up around 6.30, and um, we both got ready. I jumped in the shower, and she got dressed, and I remember her coming in and saying, all right, I'm taking off. She did send me some text messages uh, a little later, or shortly after that. She had mentioned that she was going to stay at the house, at uh, the ex-husband's house, with the kids, uh, or depending on how traffic and weather conditions were, she was going to take them out. So as the day went on, Paul only got even more anxious about the fact that Crystal wasn't replying. That's not like Crystal not to reply back fairly quickly. So um, I thought that was kind of weird, but, you know, maybe, maybe she was with family getting things ready. He finally decided he could not take it anymore. If Crystal wasn't replying to him, He'd talk to somebody who knew her super well, her uncle Jeff. So Paul called Jeff, and he explained the entire situation. He asked if Jeff had heard from Crystal, but Jeff said that he had texted with her, but only very briefly. I received a message Friday from her stating that uh, about a billboard her boyfriend had put up for her. Crystal sends him an image of the billboard and says, and you are so sweet, to which he replies, I love you and I'll always support you. So at first, Jeff kind of just shrugged everything off. He had just heard from Crystal and he knew that she was fine. But then, just to make sure, Jeff sent Crystal another text message. But she didn't reply, and she also didn't pick up when he called either. So now, he and Paul were both worried. Jeff reached out to his wife, Crystal's aunt, and she went through the exact same process too. First, she thought it was no big deal. Then she tried calling and texting Crystal for herself. And then when she didn't hear anything, she realized that there was a problem. I mean, remember, after all, Crystal was a realtor. So even in the worst of the worst type of weather, she would have had her phone nearby in case a client had an urgent issue. So the fact that she was ignoring literally everybody was a very, very odd. And by the next morning, Crystal still hadn't texted or called anyone, and nobody had seen her either. So Paul and her family called around, and then that's when they learned that she never even picked up her kids from Steve's house the day before. So it just didn't add up. I mean, Crystal was extremely responsible in general, but I mean, over the moon, over the top responsible when it came to her kids. So by this point, her uncle was understandably pretty worried and had a very terrible feeling in the pit of his stomach. He knew that it was time to get the police involved and he filed a missing person report that very morning. Chambers County Sheriff's Office. My niece. Okay, your niece. No one can get a hold of her. Right off of the bat, too, the police thought that there was foul play involved. There was no indication whatsoever that Crystal had gone anywhere on her own. I mean, for starters, she never would have left Madden and Maui behind. They were her entire world. Not to mention the fact that she just bought her own home. She was also planning a trip out of the country with Paul just the very next month, a separate trip from the cruise, where the two of them were going to go to Europe. She also had been working hard at her job, just like usual, so even with the recent divorce, she was in a really good place in her life. She had no reason to want to leave or want to flee. And in fact, just one day before Crystal went missing, she texted Paul saying, Being with you is the best feeling ever. I feel like the luckiest girl in the whole world, and I love being in love with you. You are everything I ever wanted. 
And then another text to Paul from that very same day read, I'm so very excited to go overseas for the first time and most importantly, to experience it all with you. So I just gotta ask, I mean, does that sound like somebody who was planning to walk out on their own life? I mean, it was clear that Crystal and Paul were in the honeymoon stage of their relationship. So it's great that the police were taking things seriously and they treated her case like a potential crime right off the bat because things weren't adding up. But the problem was, they couldn't leap into action like they needed to right away. Because by the time Crystal was reported missing, Hurricane Harvey had officially hit Texas. It was a Category 4 storm, meaning that winds between 130 and 155 miles per hour were just brewing. And the storm surge was anywhere from 13 to 18 feet. Now, if you're not familiar, the storm surge describes how much the water on the coast had risen during the hurricane compared to the average levels. So more than 15,000 houses were damaged and over 100 people died. Southern Texas alone got more than 40 inches of rain in just 48 hours, which, as you can imagine, made the flooding absolutely catastrophic. So imagine all of the sheer chaos and the amount of calls that were coming into 911, right? Then add in somebody who was reported missing as a single missing person. It's not that Crystal mattered any less than all of the other people who were in trouble, but it was almost like a kind of sit down, take a number situation. We got to address the most pressing issues first, something like that. It was truly the worst timing imaginable. I mean, it was so bad that some of the police officers who were supposed to help find her had lost their own homes. And so they now had their families that they had to take care of as well. But even with all of their other issues, these police officers still were determined to find Crystal and give her family some answers especially because they were so convinced that foul play was a factor here. How confident are you that she was not a victim of this storm? I'm very confident. She is not a victim of this storm. We, we, we feel very, very confident that she's not a victim of this storm. Now, we all know that this is standard, but the police started by looking at the two main men in Crystal's life, Steve and Paul. Both of them were fairly cooperative, but they also both kind of set off a red flag after red flag during their interrogations. See, Paul agreed to take a polygraph. Apparently, the police never told him his results, but he did fail. And even though Paul wasn't notified about that failure, he had to have had a sense of it and or had a sense that it wasn't going well based on what he said in interviews later. When it came time to talk about the day of the disappearance, Paul told the detectives that Crystal left his house around 7.30 in the morning. As for proof? Well, it was on the news. See, Paul still had some home security footage which showed Crystal leaving his home right when he said she had. But instead of sharing it with the investigators, you know, the people who were trying to find her and get her home safe and sound, he passed it along to reporters. And until the clips hit the actual news airwaves, the police had never even seen them before, which did have them wondering about Paul's motives here. It seemed like he was more interested in making himself look innocent than actually helping the police find Crystal. They asked him for this footage when they saw it, and he did hand it over, but it took him a couple of days, which again, seemed pretty odd. And he looked even more suspicious once they got a good look at this footage. Like you saw a minute ago, there are two different clips of Crystal leaving. One was from an interior camera, and it showed her walking through Paul's house on her way to the door. And then the other one was from the outside. In that one, Crystal was already in the parking lot, about to get into her car. However, the video of Crystal walking through Paul's house showed her carrying her purse and shoes. She's wearing what looks to be a long black or maybe even purple dress. And this clip is timestamped from August 25th at 7.09 a.m., which, yes, did corroborate with Paul's story. Now, at first glance, the video from outside of Crystal getting into her car appears to be pretty similar. It looks like she's again carrying her purse and her shoes and wearing a dress. But the dress looks like a lighter color than the one from the clip that was taken inside the house. And even weirder, the clip from outside is timestamped almost an entire week before the disappearance. This clip says it was 7.35 a.m. on August 19th. Now, Paul said that this was all just a technical error. According to him, the IT person who originally set up the cameras had set up the date wrong, so the clips were from the right day. It was just that they were timestamped wrong. But it still wasn't a good look, and then you add in this kind of like multi-changing color dress just does not look good. Yes, again, it could be different lighting, but it also could mean that it was a different day when Crystal was wearing a different outfit. So basically, it looked like Paul might have messed with this footage. 
Had he doctored the footage and released it to the media before showing it to the police? I mean, specifically because he wanted to get ahead of the story with evidence that made him look innocent? After all, he was doing a lot of interviews with different outlets at the time, and he was very involved with the media in general. It all just rubbed the detectives the wrong way, and I don't want to make it sound like he was 100% shady 100% of the time. He wasn't. Paul joined a bunch of the search parties for Crystal, which may seem like the absolute bare minimum, but I mean, honestly, how many cases have we seen? where the boyfriend or the husband or the ex completely refused to just help at all. He also contributed $5,000 for a reward that Crystal's uncle Jeff was offering for any tips that led to her whereabouts, led to her discovery, led to wherever she had gone. And like I mentioned before, Paul was pretty cooperative. He willingly came in for questioning, he gave DNA samples, handed over his cell phone records, and eventually shared that CCTV camera footage. Even if he did make the mistake of not giving that footage to the investigators before he gave it to the news outlets. And it's also worth remembering that Paul wasn't the only possible suspect that the police were looking at. Because Crystal's ex-husband Steve also failed his polygraph test when he took one. Did you take a polygraph test? Yes, ma'am. What were the results? They didn't tell me the results, um, but there was a, yeah, a lot of yelling and, and screaming, and it wasn't a good experience for me. So I don't know if I passed or failed. They didn't really state. How did he do in the polygraph? He, he did fail the polygraph. So he lied. Well, he wasn't forthcoming on all those uh, questions that we had in the initial uh, interviews with him. The investigators never really went into more detail on what exactly he did, other than he was, quote, not being forthcoming about information. Plus, when the detectives questioned Steve, he was still wearing his wedding ring. It was a pretty big red flag because it seemed like he was more or less announcing that he wasn't over Crystal and that maybe he wasn't ready to accept that she had moved on. Then, when he talked about their relationship after the divorce, he told the authorities that they got along well, that they were doing okay with co-parenting, and he made it seem like they had this very clean, very easy separation. But it didn't take long for the detectives to realize that Steve took their breakup way, way harder than he was letting on. Crystal's closest friends and family members said that before Crystal left Steve, he even threatened to take his own life. She even called the police because she was so worried about what Steve might do to himself or even to the kids. So there was a record of that earlier threat too. So the police were realizing that the time after the divorce wasn't the casual, mutual breakup that Steve had made it out to be. So clearly, if Steve was serious about harming himself or somebody else, it suggested that he might become violent once he realized that Crystal really was leaving for good. So naturally, the police had to ask him about the day that she went missing. Steve said that Crystal never showed up that morning, that whatever happened to her must have happened before she made it to his house. Except apparently, nobody believed that. In fact, the same day that Crystal's uncle Jeff reported her missing, he went over to Steve's with two other relatives, and they all confronted Steve. They thought he knew more than what he was saying, but Steve stuck to his story. He said he had not seen Crystal at all. Well, afterward, his five-year-old daughter Maui told the police something totally different, namely that she saw her mother and hugged her that day. Now, in fairness, five-year-olds don't always have a great sense of time, but the police also found Crystal's purse at Steve's home. Her phone wasn't in it, but either way, it would be weird for her to leave it there for a full day. Because remember, she spent the night at Paul's before she was supposed to go to Steve's. So that would mean that if Steve didn't have anything to do with her disappearance, then she had left her purse a full day or more before she went missing and never mentioned it to anybody. There was also one other very suspicious detail, although it only appeared in one article in Outsmart magazine. But the article claimed that when the police searched Steve's house, they found one of Crystal's black dresses in the laundry machine. And the dress that was in the laundry looked a lot like the one that Crystal was wearing in the security camera footage before leaving Paul's house the day that she went missing. If it was the same dress, had she gone to Steve's, changed clothes, and then thrown her dirty clothes in the washer? If she had, that would contradict Steve saying that she never made it to their house. Now, obviously, you can own more than one black dress. Believe me, there's nothing weird about buying multiples when you find a particular outfit that works for you. But you know what's also weird about that clip that Paul provided to the news and to the police? She had her purse with her, the same purse that the police found at Steve's house afterward. So clearly, somebody here was lying. 
Either the security video clips were fake, which they definitely could be since I already talked about those discrepancies and the timestamps, or if they were real, Steve was hiding the fact that Crystal did, in fact, make it to his house. So what was really going on here? Was it the new boyfriend? Was it the ex-husband who thought he was going to be a soon-to-be future husband again? What was the truth here? Who was lying? And more importantly, where the heck is Crystal? And as if all of that isn't suspicious enough, it's worth keeping in mind that Steve and Paul weren't the only people that police looked at. I mean, even if someone is acting super, super suspicious, that definitely doesn't mean that you ignore every other suspect. And as bad as Paul and Steve looked, there was so much more. The detectives also looked at Crystal's uncle Jeff, the man who raised her, and the one who first reported her as missing. But after he made that initial report of her missing, he almost went out of his way to make the police's job more difficult. First, before the investigators could do a formal search, he went to Crystal's house to look for clues. He took multiple family members over as well, basically just trampling through a potential crime scene. It made it almost impossible for the detectives to search for fingerprints, for footprints, for any of that stuff later on. Now, in Jeff's defense, he said that he felt like he had to take matters into his own hands. He was very worried, and he didn't feel like the police were making any real progress and that they were moving too slow. He wanted to do anything that he possibly could do to bring Crystal home. Of course, all of his so-called help was the opposite of helpful, though. And it did seem like the moves that you might pull if you actually wanted to, I don't know, slow down the investigation. Besides the searches that he did on his own, Jeff also hired a private investigator. Which again, good intentions, yes. But how helpful is it if it's just getting in the way of the real investigators who are working tirelessly on the case? The local DA, Cheryl, even spoke out saying, this is not a game to us. This is not a hobby. This is what we do. But you don't bring some amateur super sleuth wannabe when you're in the middle of a missing persons investigation. So it's not clear if Jeff's private investigator actually interfered with the investigation in some way or not, but it definitely annoyed the authorities. There was one other reason that the police suspected Jeff, but honestly, it's something that I don't know if I even necessarily agree with or even understand, but I'll let you know and you can be the judge and decide for yourself. They kept saying that he was extremely emotional, maybe even the most emotional person in Crystal's entire family, which on its own doesn't sound that mysterious or shady to me. He's the one who raised her. It's a family member. But I guess if you read between the lines, the police thought that maybe he was over the top to a certain degree, maybe that he was faking the emotion. It's hard to say because they didn't explicitly say that, so I'm just guessing at what the police were thinking there, but take a listen. Our main objective is just to get Crystal back home. <laughs> Now, I do think that it's worth highlighting that Jeff was not a fan of Paul at all. I mean, he didn't love Steve either, don't get me wrong here, but he literally told investigators that Paul reminded him of Hannibal Lecter. He also said that Paul really creeped him out, but he couldn't put his finger on the exact reason why. And at the end of the day, that's a pretty good summary of the investigation as a whole. There were a lot of bad feelings on every single side of it, and a lot of people who, quite frankly, deserved some side-eye, but nothing solid. So the days went by, and the police still couldn't find Crystal. They also couldn't close in on any one single suspect, because the guys in her life all had these varying degrees of shadiness, of suspicion, of red flags. Eventually, the police did rule out Uncle Jeff as a possible person of interest, and then from there, they really focused on Steve and Paul. Around this time, the police also managed to pull Crystal's cell phone records, which really helped them make this next big break in the case. The good news was they were able to trace Crystal's last cell phone ping to a nearby marshy area. The bad news was that the flooding from that hurricane made it nearly impossible to get to that area, let alone search it. So they had to wait until the water went down, meaning lots of evidence could potentially get lost or destroyed. So the police were now playing a waiting game. And luckily, while they were waiting, another huge lead came through. And when I say that it was a huge lead, I mean maybe the biggest possible break. This was on August 29th, 2017, four days after Crystal's disappearance. And a lot had happened in those few days. A random person texted Crystal's cousin to say that they thought that they had spotted her car parked outside of a Motel 6. They weren't sure if it was actually Crystal's or if maybe it was another car with the same make and model. Because of the storm, it was about halfway submerged underwater, and the tipster also couldn't see the license plate. All they could tell was that it was a black Mercedes, just like Crystal's. So eventually, the water went down just enough so that you could see the license plate so that it became visible. And sure enough, it was Crystal's. 
So the authorities practically raced over to this motel right away, right? And right away, they confirmed that the car was unlocked and the keys were still in the ignition. So this made it seem like whoever took Crystal must have obviously driven there. And she didn't leave her car like that, right? How would have no reason to leave it like that? Keys in the ignition unlocked? Unfortunately, though, they couldn't check for fingerprints because of all of the flooding. Luckily, there were a bunch of businesses, though, nearby, and several of them had working security cameras. So the cameras showed that on August 26th, 2017, at 6 37 a.m., Crystal's car pulled into this Motel 6 parking lot. The driver wasn't super visible in the footage, but then five hours later, Steve was seen pulling into a gas station near the motel. And he didn't just get out and fill up his tank, he walked right over to Crystal's car. That's how close it was. Almost like he was checking to see if it would still be there. You know, the way that he would if he was the one who had left it there earlier. And as if that wasn't suspicious enough, some other cameras nearby also picked up on somebody riding a bike right by Crystal's car later that day. Again, presumably to check and see if the car was still there. Now the figure had a hood up and it was hard to make out any facial features, but the police pulled footage from different stores that sold bikes and they found out that Steve bought a bike at Walmart on the morning of the 26th. So with that, Steve pretty much stepped right up into the number one suspect spot. But the police weren't ready to arrest him yet because they didn't have Crystal's body. Crystal still hasn't been found. And Steve still insisted he was totally innocent in all of this. He literally came into the sheriff's office, sat down, talked with them for four or five hours at a time, and would just deny everything, would just say how innocent he was, and then he would leave. And it almost kind of felt like it might have been a little bit of a game to him, knowing they had nothing. To make matters worse, with Crystal gone, Steve now had full custody of the kids. Her family was worried that he might do something to them, especially after learning about the threat that he had made on his own life just months before. So that's when things got extra intense. The DA decided that based on the evidence that they had, the kids were not safe in Steve's care. So they took them into protective custody. Steve was obviously outraged. He was furious by this and he fought against this order. But the DA pushed back and they told Steve that he would never see his kids again unless he showed them where Crystal's body was. It was a super, super bold move, but it had the potential to really pay off. I mean, best case scenario, they'd get Steve to cooperate with the investigation. Worst case, he would just keep denying everything, but I mean, he was already doing that, so it wasn't like the police would be any worse off in that scenario. They had to shoot their shot. And luckily, Steve went for the deal. He told the investigators that he wanted to spend one last night in the comfort of his own home. Then, he would go to the sheriff's office the very next morning, and he would confess to everything. So, the police, hopeful and not really having many other options to go with, they agreed to those terms. And that night when he was home, Steve called and texted his oldest daughter, Krista, repeatedly. He said she needed to come home from college immediately because she probably wouldn't see him for a while if she didn't. She was extremely confused by all of this. She didn't know what was going on, but she did what he asked. When she got to his house, Steve told her that Madden and Maui were going to go stay with somebody else for a while and that he was gonna be going to the police station the very next day to confess. He gave her some photo albums, some important financial documents, and he also gave her the keys to his Mustang. Now, my first thought when I heard this was that after Krista left, Steve was going to take his own life. He was offloading everything. He was going to take his own life, and he was saying his final goodbyes. Also, that he would never have to face trial or jail time. And honestly, I'm amazed that the police even let him have that last night at home. I understand they really didn't have a lot to work with, but we've seen it happen in so many cases. I mean, Fotis Dulos comes to mind where it wasn't that he was allowed to be home, but you know what I mean? Like, if you're given the opportunity to take your own life so that you could avoid punishment and trial and being bad in your kid's eyes, I mean, a lot of perpetrators have done that historically in the past. So... I get why they did it because they didn't really have any other cards to play, but it still feels like a risky move. But they got very, very lucky because Steve stuck to his word. The next morning, he reported to the sheriff's office and he started off by telling the investigators that he had been lying the entire time about Crystal not coming over. 
she did come to his house, and pretty much right away, she and Steve started fighting about the divorce. Steve had wanted to get back together, as I mentioned. I mean, he hadn't even wanted the divorce to happen in the first place. And I think from the way that Crystal had been acting, he probably knew that she was dating other people by this point, especially after the whole cruise debacle, and he did not like that at all. Now, for her part, Crystal was done with him and done with the marriage, and she didn't appreciate Steve trying to tell her what to do. So the argument apparently got more and more heated and then it eventually turned physical. Steve admitted to strangling Crystal to death in the living room, all while their children were in the next room over. Once he had realized what he had done, Steve knew that he needed to get rid of Crystal's body, so he wrapped her up in a blanket, and then he put her in the trunk of the Mercedes. Then he hid her body, and he abandoned that car at the motel. Now, it sounds like jealousy and possessiveness were pretty big motives for Steve. But those weren't the only ones money was a factor too. Because remember, Steve depended on all of the cash that Crystal brought in. And not just for little things here and there for the kids. I mean, pretty much anything that Steve wanted, he'd buy with Crystal's money. And she had gotten very fed up with it, especially since they were no longer a couple. So not long before she disappeared, Crystal had finally cut Steve off from all of her finances. And it had not sat well for Steve, not at all. And I'm not saying that this was the reason that he killed her. He wasn't set to inherit any money from her or anything like that. And with Crystal dead, he obviously wouldn't be able to use her as a meal ticket anymore either. But it was just another layer of their very tumultuous dynamic and his anger, the, whatever fueled his rage. So now, even though Steve had admitted and confessed to the murder, to what happened, to the reasons... He still did not want to say where he dumped Crystal's body, which is very interesting because that was the whole deal that the police offered him in the first place. Show us Crystal's body if you ever want to see your kids again. So I've got to imagine that by now he knew that he was going to prison for a very long time and that he was never going to get custody back of his kids. So instead, he kind of tried to use Crystal's body like a bargaining chip. Basically, he said he'd show the police where to find her if they promised they weren't going to pursue the death penalty against him. And the detectives, once again, didn't have a lot of cards to play, and they needed Crystal's remains. And they knew that this was not something that Steve was going to compromise on, so they agreed. So that's when Steve took them to a wooded area, and they found Crystal's badly decomposed corpse. It was enough for the police to officially arrest Steve and book him on charges of first-degree murder. Now, as we know, sometimes it can take years for a trial to ever see the light of day. And unfortunately, that was the case for Crystal. It took two years. And during those two years, Steve must have spent a lot of time thinking about what he should say in his defense. Because the story that he tried to tell on the stand, it was a doozy, guys. He said that on the morning that Crystal went missing, she came over, and the two of them had sex. Then afterward, Steve apparently just got so overwhelmed with love for her that he, quote, hugged her to death. Those are his words. He hugged her to death. It might be one of the most absurd excuses I've ever heard. And it's important because Steve was essentially saying that he had killed Crystal in a crime of passion. And his defense team argued that hugging Crystal to death met the legal criteria for a crime of passion. So if the jury found that he had in fact committed a crime of passion, the sentence could have been anywhere from 2 to 20 years max. Which for a murder is absolutely insane and honestly very scary to think about. To think about that somebody can murder somebody in a crime of passion type way which happens all the time because of domestic disputes, stalkers, all sorts of things and they can get two years potentially, that is so frightening to think about. Now, Steve's lawyers also had him read text messages that Crystal had sent to all of her different lovers during the time that she was cheating on him during their marriage. And honestly, I don't see how this helped his case at all because it seems like he was just showing that he had the motive to want Crystal dead, but hey, I'm no lawyer. Maybe they were trying to do a smear campaign against her. I don't know. But of course, the prosecution was on their A-game, and they had a lot more together. They even had Steve's daughter Maui testify against him, and it sent his story just crumbling, crashing into the ground. Because sadly, Maui witnessed the entire murder. And at the time of the trial, she was only seven years old, and she told the most harrowing story that it left the entire courtroom in tears. She said that she was in the bathroom when she saw Steve and Crystal arguing. She heard Steve say that he didn't want Crystal to be with anybody else, and her mom replied, I'm going to go away 
and I'm going to take my children with me. Then, Maui saw her dad Steve push Crystal onto the bed and tell her, no, you're not. Steve pinned Crystal down using his full weight and slammed his hands on her face. Crystal tried to fight back, but Steve was too big. He was too strong. And this next part, I can't even begin to imagine. Maui said that Steve was strangling Crystal. And then they both turned and they saw her. They saw little Maui. Crystal tried to mouth, help, but she could not get the words out. Then Steve got super angry and he told his daughter, he told Maui, go to your room, don't tell anybody what you've seen. Now that testimony alone just sends shivers down my back because I can't imagine an adult dealing with that kind of trauma, let alone a little girl who was, what, five years old at the time? And in fact, it sounds like Maui had some serious emotional issues after the murder, which her new caretaker testified to as well. After Steve's arrest, Crystal's good friend Mandy stepped up to take care of the kids. And Mandy testified that one time, Maui drew a picture of her entire family with tiny handwriting that said, why did you get mad and kill mom and make her not breathe? On another occasion, Maui and Mandy went to their secret room, which was basically just a room where the two of them could talk without Madden listening in. And there, Maui described the murder to Mandy and even told her that later that morning, her dad Steve, Maui, and Madden all sat down together and they ate donuts for breakfast. Now, luckily, it sounds like Madden didn't see anything, but he did hear Maui talking about it later. Now, as awful as all of that had to have been for Maui, I really do believe that her testimony is what swayed the jury the most here, because it only took them three and a half hours of deliberation before they reached a verdict. They found Steve guilty, and they sentenced him to 50 years in prison. As for the kids, they're currently living with Mandy in Las Vegas, and she plans on adopting them. Hopefully, with Mandy, they can still experience the life that Crystal always wanted them to have. But sadly, all Crystal wanted was for her children to live a more stable life than she had lived. And in the end, they ended up losing their parents, just like she did, at an even younger age than she was. And while we're talking about Mandy, I do want to pause and share one interesting story about her. Based on some interviews that she gave, it sounds like she woke up the same morning that Crystal went missing, and something kept telling her in her gut to check on Crystal. She hadn't even heard that anybody else was worried about her at that point, but she started texting and calling, and she had this weird anxiety that something horrible had happened. I mean, it was just spooky, kind of like intuition. Either way, these days, Mandy and the kids are trying to live the happy, stable life that Crystal had dreamed of. But honestly, I mean, you have to ask, how can you after everything that they went through? Sadly, when you experience a terrible loss like the murder of a parent, all you can do afterward is try to rebuild as many times as it possibly takes. I'm glad that they're out of that house because that is a blessing because if the threats that Steve had been making about taking his own life and the fear that he may take the lives of the children as well, it could very well have ended in a Susan Powell type of situation, if you're familiar with that case. So I am happy that they have been removed and they're now safely with Mandy. But still, how do you even begin to reconcile the loss of a parent in such a brutal way? And how do you grapple with the trust issues you'll have in the future when your own father could do this to your mother? Not to mention for little Maui witnessing all of that. It's just so much trauma that you would have to unpack and work through, and my heart breaks for those kids. While I'm happy they're safe, my heart is just broken for them. I appreciate you listening to Crystal's story today and letting her voice live on so that these people and these stories can help keep people accountable but also raise awareness because we talk about it all the time. Sometimes it is the person closest to you that betrays you the most, but the more we talk about it, not only is their voice carrying on and we are honoring them, but... We're also hopefully, maybe I'm naive, but hopefully raising awareness so that people can start to identify these red flags, whether it's in their own situation or somebody close to them, a friend, a family member, so that hopefully the world just starts to move forward in a safer and less dangerous way. Again, I know that's like super optimistic and wishful thinking, but that's my hope in all of it. All right, guys, thanks again for tuning in and until the next one, stay safe. Bye.